Hi, I'm Mark Buckley, and I'm glad to be bringing you this message. I'm going to be talking with you about passing judgment. Fifty years ago, almost, was the first sermon I ever gave to my home church, and this was the subject from Matthew chapter 7. So if you've got a Bible, open up. And I want to talk about a very simple subject, something that really all of us have to wrestle with. And as I begin to illustrate this, I want to explain to you why Jesus says what he says. We're going to look at what Jesus said, then we're going to look at what the Apostle Paul said, and, uh, and then contrast and compare the two. In Matthew 7, verse 1, Jesus says this, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Let me pray for you. Father God, open our eyes, give us understanding, let the truth set us free so that we might love boldly. In Jesus' name, amen. So I bumped into a guy, and we got some pictures of this guy. It's the kind of guy that you might see lurking around your church someday. And I asked this guy a question. His name is Alec. I said, Alec, it's obvious that you've been the kind of guy that has seen the world. You've traveled in many places. You've been influenced by many cultures. How many times have you been incarcerated? How many times have you been arrested for various offenses? How many times have you smoked marijuana? How many times? Just estimate to us, how many times have you used other kinds of illegal drugs? And Alec gave us this answer. Alec, that's sort of shocking. Let me ask you another question. Obviously, you're a handsome man. Obviously, you've dressed to impress women. Tell us, how many different women have you been romantically involved with over the course of the 30-some years of your life as you've traveled from, from through America and Indonesia and Europe how many times when you've gone to Central America and different places have you been involved romantically with different women? Show us, Alec, the number. One? His own wife? Colleen? That's the only time? And I'm illustrating the point that Jesus made when he said, do not judge. Number one, the reason is because we're not qualified to judge. We judge by outer appearances. God judges the heart. Alex Seekins has been a man of God. He grew up at Living Streams Church. He married the only woman he's ever been in romantically involved with. He's never been involved in any kind of illegal activities. He's never blown his mind with drugs and alcohol. You would assume that a guy that looked like that had done all kinds of things, and your assumption would be wrong. Now, Alec told me a story that I thought was pretty funny, and I wanted to tell it to you. He was on a mission trip. He was one of the leaders. They were down in Guatemala. They were at the airport. They were uh, keeping an eye out for these kids. They wanted to bring them back safely. That was their responsibility. And, and across the terminal, Alec spots a very suspicious-looking character. And so he makes sure to keep an eye on this guy and, uh, and an eye on the kids. He doesn't want anybody interfering with the kids. So when, when the time was right, he walks over towards where he had spotted the guy just to make sure. And guess what he saw? He saw a full-length mirror. The guy he saw that looked so suspicious across the hall or the, across the room was himself. He saw his own image and he got concerned. <laughs> That's why Jesus said, with the measure you judge, the same way you judge, you will be judged. Do you, have you ever met somebody that says, you know, when I first met you, I really didn't like you. I've, I've had people say that to me, and um, I've never had this response. That's funny, because I really liked you. The truth is, if somebody saw us and they didn't like us, the chances are we didn't like them back, even if we didn't have much interaction with them, because there's something about when people are passing judgment on us that we put up a barrier, we protect ourselves from that person. We don't want to be judged. We don't want to be hurt. We don't want to be used or abused by that other person. 
Now, when I've gone out sharing the gospel with people, which I've done on many occasions, the number one scripture that most people who are not following Christ are going to quote to you is this one. Judge not lest you be judged, right? They're saying that because they think that we've come out to judge them. Jesus said, I didn't come to judge the world, but to save it. If God wanted to judge the world, he would have never sent his son. Why bother? Just let people stew in their own mess. Let, leave them to their own devices. Their wickedness of man's heart perpetrates evil and, and causes messes and we harm one another all the time. Jesus came to intervene to bring us salvation. And he's teaching us how to love. He's teaching us how to live. He's teaching us how to relate. So I was in San Diego on vacation, staying at a friend's house with my wife, Christina, and another couple who are friends of ours came to stay with us there. With the three of us all were in the same church in Novato, California, and so we're hanging out in San Diego, and it's Sunday morning. So my other friend, who's a pastor, he and I decide we're going to ride bicycles to the church where our wives are going to go, and, uh, and the kids that were there they were all going to go in the van, but we wanted to get some exercise. Now, this church is called Mount Carmel um, Presbyterian Church, and it's way up on top of a hill in San Diego. So it's a hard bike ride, but we're on vacation. We want to get a good workout. So we take off, Alan and I, about half an hour before the service starts because we don't want to be late. And it's a, it's a good hard ride, half an hour to get up to the top of this mountain. Well, we get going, we get about 10 minutes into the ride and I'm pumping as hard as I can uh, going up this hill and all of a sudden, boom, the chain on the bicycle snaps. So I can't do anything about it. We, we literally get on, back on the bikes and I coast and I could coast a lot of the way and then sort of push the bike the rest of the way back to the guy's house, get another bike. Now we're like, going to be late for the church service. So we get on these bikes and we're hurrying as hard as we can. It's summer. It's like the end of July. We're sweating like crazy. Uh, you know, we finally get to the church service. We're late. We, we chain our bikes up to the cyclone fence. We go into the service and we're like just totally sweat pouring off of us. And we decide we're going to go into the bathroom and wash up. And I spot one of the deacons, one of the ushers, one of the, the guys that they use for security. And he sees us and we had been wearing shorts and, and my Alan had a sweatshirt and I had a t-shirt and we looked totally messed up. And we immediately go through the, the sanctuary doors and then head to the bathroom in the foyer. And so he follows us, he follows us right into the bathroom. And uh, Alan and I just start laughing because here we are, we're both pastors. We had been pastors for years. We came to bless that congregation, to, to fellowship with people, to worship, to give, to encourage. And they're treating us like we're homeless guys that can't be trusted, that we got to keep an eye on them every moment they're on this campus because they're probably here just to rip somebody off. And I don't blame them for judging us, but sometimes we have to remember that when Jesus says something, he knows what he's talking about. He says, don't judge. With the, when you do judge, you will be judged. You are making false assumptions. You don't know what people are really like. Now, my mom is one of the most gracious people you'll ever meet. She's 96 years old. And when I lived at her house, you know, for many years, and I moved back for a year and a half when I was a young believer, and this was in the 70s. And I used to pick up hitchhikers a lot. Uh, people would hitchhike from all over the country, come to California looking for the peace, love, and groovy lifestyle of California. And uh, so we'd pick up these hitchhikers. We'd tell them about Jesus. Sometimes we'd feed them dinner. We'd give them a place to stay. And my mom was really gracious about me bringing guys home and feeding them. But on this one particular occasion, I brought a guy home, and he was very grubby. He was like, uh, my mom took one look at him and, he, and she said, Mark, this guy cannot come into the house. I'm sorry, you're gonna have to feed him in the backyard. And I mean, she, she was very flexible, but this, this enough was enough. Well, 
I take him into the backyard, I bring him a nice dinner out there, and we were, I was a fence construction guy, I would do fences, decks, retaining walls, remodel jobs in those days, and we were building my mom a fence. And long story short, I had been doing another big job in San Rafael, and I had nailed a bunch of boards on this 300 some foot fence, and they all were warped the next day, so we took them all down, took them back to the lumber yard. The lumber guy said, you know, uh, okay, I'll take these boards back, but don't do this again. Um, we literally had brought back boards warped on two occasions. So we're in the backyard of my mom's house. We're building her a fence at the same time. And uh, after dinner, I was thinking of nailing the fence boards up, and I was gonna use the guy to help me. And he took one look at those boards and he said, you don't want to nail those boards up there because if you do, that lumber is green and they will warp in the hot sun tomorrow as the, the moisture in the board starts to leach out. You've got to let them dry out a little more. They've just come out of the sawmill. And when he said that, I realized he just saved me hundreds of dollars hundreds of dollars because he knew the problem even though I was a fence builder I didn't know why my fence boards were warping he knew because he had more experience than me he was a blessing he was a blessing in disguise and that's the way I feel about myself when I travel around I've hitchhiked around as a believer and I know that anybody who blesses me is going to get blessed Jesus said that in, in the book of Genesis, I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who curse you. So when I'm out hitchhiking, I know that the promise God gave to Abraham is actually a promise for me and you because I am part of the seed of Abraham because Christ is in me. He's the descendant of Abraham. We inherit what he has provided for us because we have Christ in us. So if somebody blesses us, God will bless them. So I'm out there hitchhiking thinking, Lord, who do you want to bless today? Whoever you want to bless today, have them stop and pick me up. And I've had people receive eternal life and forgiveness of sins because they picked me up hitchhiking and I've shared the gospel and they've accepted Christ. I've had other guys blessed in all kinds of ways, whether it's financially because they give to my ministry or whether it's through insight and wisdom because they bless me and God uses me to bless them back. And, or he maybe doesn't even use me to bless them, but he brings somebody else into their life to bless them. You are a blessing. You've been blessed by God so that you can be a blessing. And those who bless you are going to be blessed as well. Those who judge you are asking for trouble. So in verse 3, Jesus says this, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? In other words, we have a tendency to focus on the problems of others. Do not focus on their flaws. Focus on the treasure that is in them. Everybody has a treasure in them. If Christ is in you, you have a treasure in you. And it says in the Old Testament that a man of wisdom will draw that treasure out. He will draw that treasure out. I believe that's in Proverbs or Ecclesiastes. And I want to suggest to you that one of the reasons we argue and and fight and hassle and pass judgment and get so fed up with each other is because we focus on their flaws. When I do marriage counseling, one of the most important principles for every marriage is this. Be thankful for who they are and not frustrated about what they're not. No matter how good, no matter how beautiful the woman you marry is, no matter how funny she is and how well she can make you laugh, no matter how great of a lover she is, she's going to have some flaws. She's going to make mistakes. She's going to overlook some things. There's going to be some areas of life that she's not going to be very good at, and it's going to bug you after a while. 
And no matter how handsome your guy is, no matter what a good provider he is, no matter how good of a dad he is and how well he would love your kids, there's going to be some flaws. He's going to make some messes. He's going to bug you. He's going to get on your nerves. He's not going to appreciate you at times. He's not going to be sensitive and understand you. He won't listen when he should listen. Every single guy has some flaws. Now, one of my... Uh, principles in, in counseling is this. When you first get married, you have about this much grace and you use it up. Now, if you marry somebody who's been married a couple of times, you might only start with this much grace and you use it up twice as fast because we start relationships with hope and expectation and love, but then the hassles and the trials and the flaws have a tendency to bring us back to rock bottom again. But fortunately, when Christ is in you, even rock bottom is not a defeat. It's just the end of your human resources, and then you have to rely on God's grace and his resurrection power to get you back on your feet. We all need resurrection power. We all need the grace of God, or none of our marriages would work. None of the ministries would flourish. There'd be no lasting friendships in life if we didn't know how to forgive one another, love one another, and serve one another. So Jesus said, pay attention to your own situation. In verse 4, he says, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? There's a pastor I used to work with by the name of Ken, and uh, he literally took over for me when I left California and I left our church uh, hundreds of people. And it was a really tough job because some of the people were upset that I was leaving. Some of the people were comparing me to him. And uh, I came back to California and I was trying to help him out. And, and when I was trying to help him, sometimes I think I made a situation worse. And, and Ken used to do some carpentry work as well. And he had a situation happen one time where he was literally cutting um, some metal like fiber board with a skill saw. And as he was cutting it, a little piece of the metal got into his eye. And that was a very, very painful situation. Now, if somebody gets a metal shard in their eye, you're not gonna just say, hold still and try and pull it out with your finger. He had to go to a doctor. He had to be held down on a table. It had to be done with precision or he would have lost the sight of his eye. You can't just grab something that is embedded in an eyeball. It's so dangerous if you would try and do that. It's not like just getting a little speck of dirt or dust. And that's the same principle that happens sometimes when people have some profound issues. Do you know I've had some profound issues? I've had health issues. I remember a guy coming to pray for me when I was in the hospital and a um, bacteria had gotten into my bloodstream and it destroyed my mitral valve. And a couple came into my hospital bed, even though um, Christina was trying to run interference so too many people didn't show up. But they came in, they wanted to pray for me. I was glad they prayed. And, but they got frustrated. They were frustrated because they thought I should have been healed. And the reason I wasn't healed was because I didn't have enough faith. Well, what happened was I had open heart surgery. It took eight hours for the surgeon to replace the mitral valve with a new one. And I had almost died, but by the grace of God, when he got in to do the mitral valve replacement, he also did a bypass, which I had one of my major arteries was very blocked. And so maybe the bacterial infection that caused them to change the mitral valve saved my life because I never got a heart attack from the blocked artery. Who knows what God's plans and purposes were. All I know is this, that the couple who thought that I didn't have enough faith to get healed after they prayed for me left our church. I've never seen them since, but I am healthy and alive because God chose to heal me in his way. And in that particular case, he used the doctor. Other times he doesn't use the doctor. But if you judge somebody on the basis of how they get healed or what kind of job they have or how they relate to uh, this situation or that situation, you can make a big mistake. You can, you can uh, literally dig yourself into a hole and separate yourself from people rather than building somebody up, which is what God wants us to do. 
Jesus said this in verse 5, You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Why does he tell us not to judge? Because we get it wrong. And when we get it wrong, we end up making a bigger mess. Now, there was a guy that I knew who had been in prison, and uh, he had started coming to our church, and I really liked him. I thought he had, had confessed his sins and changed. And then uh, I literally wanted to make him an elder in our church. But one of the other pastors said, no, Mark, I don't think that's right. And I got in a fight with the guy. I was like, I can't believe it. You know, he's been forgiven. He's a changed man. Well, he said, I know, I know, but I just don't feel good about it. I don't have any peace about it. So in frustration, I acquiesced. I, I just let it go. And we didn't make the guy an elder. Well, guess what? Within the next year, he had ripped off a whole number of people. He had swindled them. He swindled them. And my other pastor who didn't want to make him an elder was right and I was wrong. Now, was it, you, you know, you might say, well, Mark, was he judging the person? What's going on? Well, let me look further at what Jesus says about judging in Matthew 7, verse 6. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Is he talking about literal dogs? Was Jesus a cat lover? What's the deal? No, he's, some people are narcissistic. They're, they're self-consumed. They don't care about anybody else. They're spiritual dogs. They're going to take advantage of you. They're acting like pigs, the more, you know, and don't give them your pearls. In other words, if, if you're sharing with them the treasure of Christ and they're just blowing you off, don't tell them about the most precious miracle God has done for you because they're going to trample on that too. They don't care. They're demonstrating their nature. Now, we're not to be just quickly passing judgment, but somebody who's a spiritual dog or a pig, they are proving by their behavior over and over that they're not just a carnal believer that's tripping a little bit. They're somebody who's got a whole different nature altogether. So how do you figure it out? How do you know who's who? In verse 7, Jesus said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? Now, we apply this to all kinds of things. But in the context, Jesus is saying one thing about not judging. And then he's saying another thing about there are spiritual dogs and pigs out there. And you say, then, well, how do you know? We'll ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open. He's showing us the paradox of life. The paradox of life are two truths that are seemingly contradictory, but both need to be held in a dynamic tension by people that are mature. A simplistic person will say it's all this way or it's all that way. It's all black and white. People are either all evil or all good, or everybody's all good and nobody's evil. Um, th those are simplistic positions. The dynamic tension of a paradox is that people can be bad. People can be transformed out of their sinful set. I remember going to Pastor Walt Rattray uh, years ago because we had a guy get out of prison, come to our ministry, we had brought him on a men's retreat, and he ripped people off on the retreat. He literally went into their rooms when nobody was around, took their credit cards, went into town, charged a bunch of stuff, sold the stuff really quick, took the money, bought some drugs, got loaded, got caught, of course, and denied it. Just flat out denied it. And I remember talking to the guy, and he just looked me in the eye and lied about it. And I knew he was lying. And yet some guys that were ministering to this man, the guys, the ripoff guy, his name's Steve, guys who were ministering to Steve came to me and said, Mark, I think that he's, he's humbled himself. I think that he's asked forgiveness now. 
I think we should forgive him and give him another chance. And I kept thinking about Ananias and Sapphira who lied to the apostles and were struck dead. And I spoke to Pastor Walt and I said, Pastor Walt, let me ask you a question. If you have somebody who looks you right in the eye and lies to you, is there a chance that guy's ever going to make it or should we just remove him from the ministry? And he looks at me with his beautiful smile and his toothpick and he said, Mark, if I got rid of everybody who lied to me in my ministry, I wouldn't have anybody left. And uh, I realized, yeah, he's been lied to a bunch of times. I've been lied to a bunch of times. But even liars can be transformed. I know one lady who was uh, super drunk when we went over to see her in this discipleship house we ran. Her name was Donna. And uh, she's literally laying on the floor and I asked her such a wise question. And when we got there, me and my pastor friend, I said, Donna, are you drunk? And she goes, no, I'm not drunk. And then I turned to my friend and said, Ananias and Sapphira, you know, God's probably going to strike her dead for lying to us. And he just laughed me off. He had a little more experience than me. Well, Donna got sober. She repented. She started following Jesus with all her heart. She became a missionary to Mexico and then a missionary to India. She lived a fruitful life. She was a natural mom, a grandma, and she loved Jesus with all her heart. In spite of the fact that she had stumbled as a young believer, in spite of the fact that she had lied as a young believer, she came clean and God transformed her. So, Jesus says this, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Matthew 7, 12. So when everything do to others, which you would have them do for you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. How do you, want, how do you relate to people? Will you treat them the way you want to be treated? I don't really want to be judged, so I try not to judge people. But if people prove to me that they're doing evil, then... I'm not going to let them take advantage of me. I'm not going to I'm not going to just roll over because I don't want somebody yielding to my bad behavior. If I'm wrong, I know I need to be corrected and I hope somebody will love me enough to rebuke me, to correct me. They won't just yield to me because I'm pressuring them if I've got evil intention or crazy motives in my heart. And we're to love one another the way we want to be loved. If you want to have an influence for Christ in your life, then you are going to love people boldly. Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide's the gate and broad's the road that leads to destruction, and many enter it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. I, I'm mentioning that because of this. We have a tendency to think that he's talking about a narrow gate, a narrow road, and a narrow life, a boring life, a life where we're afraid to ever do anything outside of these really confined boundaries. But that's not the case. You go th down the narrow road, which is a road of dedication to Christ. You go through the narrow gate, which means you don't bring a bunch of baggage from your past because you've asked the Lord to forgive your sins. You have been honest about your sins. He died on the cross so we could be forgiven for our sins. He did not fail. He didn't come up short. His blood cleanses us. It washes us. It renews us. And then, as you enter that narrow gate, you come into the kingdom of God, which is broad, which is expansive, which is so magnificent that you can't even hardly comprehend all of the goodness, all of the variety, all of the opportunity, all of the experiences he has for you in this world and the next world because the kingdom of God is going to fill the whole earth like the, the waters that cover the sea. The kingdom of God is a manifestation of the presence of the Lord Almighty and how wise he is how unfathomable his riches are, how great his love is. We have a lot to experience in God. Now, 1 Corinthians 2, I'm going to show you what Paul says about judgment real quick before we wrap up. 
1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolish and cannot understand them because they're discerned only through the Spirit. You think what I'm saying is foolish? It may be because you don't have the Spirit of God. I remember one time I'm preaching away and uh, this couple in the middle of my message just stand up and walk out of the church. Now this guy was a very successful businessman, had a beautiful wife, they had five kids. I thought, oh great, I've just driven him out of the church. And I didn't see him again for a month. And uh, next time I saw him, I was surprised to see him back at the church and I said, oh, Charlie, I felt so bad. I didn't know if I'd see you again because you left this, you know, in the middle of my sermon. He goes, oh, Mark, it was a great sermon. We had to go pick up some friends at the airport and then we've been in, on a trip and all this. And, and I'm like, really? I thought that he was just judging me for my sermon. I misjudged him. I had one pastor friend of mine, somebody got up in the middle of his sermon and he goes, I rebuke you, sit back down right now. And, and again, it was somebody who had to go to the bathroom in the middle of the sermon, and he thought the person was defying him. He misjudged them. Pastors can misjudge, just like anybody can misjudge. So the person without the Spirit of God doesn't understand these things, but here's, here's what they don't understand. Verse 15 of 1 Corinthians 2, the person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. People with the Spirit judge things. We judge marijuana. We judge fentanyl and heroin and cocaine and meth. We judge pornography. We judge it. Is there any value in it or is it garbage? We judge TV programs. We judge music. We judge to determine whether there's value or whether it's spiritual, emotional, or physical poison. I have a dear nephew who's right now in a mental institution because for him, he didn't want to be too firm about the reality that he needed to stay away from immorality and marijuana. And he's on a short leash from God. When you're on a short leash from God, when God calls you to be a servant, you will not get away with what other people get away with sometimes because he loves you too much. He doesn't want to see you wasting your life. A person with the Spirit is not subject to mere human judgments. In other words, people don't know who we really are in Christ. God knows. But we also are in a position to judge the value of things. And if we didn't tell our kids and we didn't tell our friends and we didn't tell our brothers and sisters in Christ what has value and what doesn't have value, then we wouldn't be smart, we wouldn't be wise, we wouldn't be knowledgeable, and we wouldn't be loving. If you love somebody, you tell them the truth. And if you're in Christ, you're going to know the truth, the truth that sets you free. And those who the sun sets free, they're free indeed. So, it says in verse 16, Who has known the mind of the Lord as so as to instruct him? We have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. Our minds have been renewed. I was so burned out when I first got saved. I didn't know what was right and what was wrong, whether it was politics or religion or anything. I was screwed up, I have to admit. And it's sad to say, but it was true. And I had to make a, a point that I wanted my mind renewed. So I was going to study the Word, and I studied the Word of God every day or almost every day for three years before I really had my mind restored. I wish to tell you that it would be just about three days or three hours or three minutes, but it's not. It's a process. If you spent some years like I had done uh, degrading myself into a degenerate, then it's gonna probably take some years to build yourself back up. But you know what, you, you can discover whether you're lifting weights or taking jogs or renewing your mind, it feels good to get in shape. It feels good to get sharper. It feels good to get stronger. It feels good to have peace in your heart and feel closer to God. And that's the heritage that he's given us in Christ. Okay, last passage from 1 Corinthians 5, 
about judgment. In verse 9, he says this, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. In other words, people that are having sex and they're not in a biblically ordained marriage between a man and a woman. And he says, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or greedy or swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave the world. So, you know, your boss, your coworker, your brother, your sister, your friends, they're going to be immoral. Sometimes they're going to be greedy. Sometimes they're going to be swindlers. He says, I'm not telling you to stay away from all of them. But I now, verse 11, I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister in Christ, but is sexually immoral or greedy or idolater or slanderer or drunkard or swindler. Do not even eat with such people. Don't even eat with them. Because they say they're Christians. And the body of Christ has got to be a place of purity, of holiness, of righteousness. It's got to be a sheep pen that doesn't have wolves in it. What, and he says it this way, verse 12, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside, expel the wicked person from among you. Now, in the history, I, I was a senior pastor from 1976 to, 19, uh, to 2017. In all those years, uh, which is over 40 some years, I only had to remove a few people from our church. One guy for immorality, he's having sex with a girl in our church who had a trust fund and she bought him a car and he moved in with her and he didn't want to marry her, he just wanted to live off of her. Another guy who was committing adultery on his wife and we confronted him, we challenged him, we urged him to repent and he did it again and again. And finally we said, sorry buddy, you're not gonna be doing that kind of stuff and being a part of this church. A couple of times, guys who were swindlers one guy who was over 80 years old, and I had some of our elders investigate the situation, and uh, they said, well, we know he took advantage of somebody, but he's so old, maybe he didn't know what he was doing. I said, keep an eye on this guy. Sure enough, he ripped off another guy for $25,000. He knew exactly what he was doing. He, he would pretend to be charming and loving and caring when he's making a pitch to somebody, and he'd pretend to be naive and distant and not all there when he's uh, being confronted. We had to remove him because God's children need to be protected from swindlers. And that's why Paul said, remove the wicked person from among you because he loves his church. He died for his church. He is committed to his church. He doesn't want anybody messing with it. Doesn't want anybody taking advantage of it. You guys don't take advantage of your spiritual sisters. Do not try and take advantage of them because the Lord's watching over them and it won't end well for you if you do. Girls, don't just look for some guy to provide for you because you have a Father in heaven. Let him love you. Let him nourish you. You are cherished by him. Let him build you up and make you the woman that he has designed you to be so you can be free and then when the time's right, if there's a man, that will love and cherish you as well, and you can trust your life to, then so be it. But until then, wait, wait on the Lord. He has got a great plan for you. He wants you to be super effective. So you don't have to be a judge, you can bring salvation. You don't have to be somebody who is naive, because if somebody is an evildoer, he's gonna show you, he's gonna give you discernment, he's gonna protect you because He's got plans for you to use you. And that's good news, isn't it, for all of us? We don't deserve this blessing, but we've been chosen. We want to receive it. We want to go with it. We want to pass it on. Lord, let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God bless you.